Good morning. Good morning to everyone on the first Sunday of 2024. What a beautiful way to open it. Thank you, Catherine, for that. My name is Rebecca, and I'm your service associate for this morning, and I'm joined up here by Marcia Stevenson, and we extend a very hearty welcome to everyone here this morning. We're a small group this morning. We're not surprised. Everything, I think everyone's a little done with pomp and circumstance from Christmas, but that's good. I'm glad we're here. Uh, we'd like to extend an extra hearty welcome to anyone who's new. I know we have at least one newcomer in the room. Small numbers, it's hard to hide. Um, you'll have noticed we have coffee in the, the front foyer. We're going to try that for all the months of January, so you can have coffee on the way into the sanctuary. During, this, during the service, if you're brave, remember the bathrooms are downstairs, just saying. <laughs> Um, and uh, afterwards, uh, we're welcome to gather back in the sanctuary if you want to grab a coffee and chat. It's not like downstairs is off limits, but just for fun, we're trying something different. So here we are, we're the North Shore Unitarian community, and our mission is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. We welcome people all to our caring community where we foster spiritual growth, free of dogma, and we inspire actions in the service of life. In this community, we center ourselves on love, we endeavor to love widely and wholeheartedly. Love is our primary human function because love softens, love soothes, love smooths. Feeling loved in and by a community allows us as individuals and as a community to learn and grow safely. It allows us to express our vulnerabilities. It allows us to be wrong and to learn. And if we can embrace our own belovedness, then we can embrace others and that helps us to be a more tolerant, kind, generous community. We gather here today in this beautiful building amidst a beautiful woods uh, on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Most of us in the sanctuary are descendants of settlers on the land, but we share the reverence for this land with our First Nation neighbors. And we acknowledge the troubled history of Canada's past, a history that some of us are still just learning about. We have far to go to make real and lasting reparations. There you go. <laughs> Just to change things up a little bit for the third time. All right, today we're, um, we're going to muse on the word bittersweet, the ups and downs of being alive in a deeply flawed world. But I understand some people have been talking about this theme of bittersweet before this service even started. And so I'm going to pay homage to that before we get started. Yasha mentioned to me about bittersweet nightshade, Latin name, Solanum dulcamara beautiful purple flower. It's a plant which originally came from Europe and Asia, and it's widely naturalized in North America. Here you go, Yasha. Here's a bittersweet chocolate. Oh, okay, try it again. Ready? Three times, Yasha. Ready? Oh, she got it. That's good. Nice. <laughs> okay, well, it has this beautiful red-orange fruit, which apparently has a sweet aftertaste, hence the name bittersweet. So here's my next question, worthy of a chocolate audience participation. Are all plants of the bitter, sorry, all parts of the plant bittersweet, are they all edible? Oh, here we go. Ready, Barry? <laughs> He'll get it. <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> all right. Uh, well, so Barry gets the points for participation, but he's not wholly correct because all parts of this plant have been used for medicinal purposes ever since ancient Greek times. In fact, in the Middle Ages, it was thought to ward against um, witchcraft, and so they actually hung it around the necks of cattle, but they have used it for medicinal purposes for forever. Uh, it is somewhat poisonous less poisonous than many other of their um, genus. So interesting. Basically, it's poisonous enough that it'll make you sick, but you won't die from it. So there you go, half points there, Barry. Okay, next question. What three common vegetables belong to the same genus that the night bittersweet nightshade? Hint, they're beautiful flowering plants that are vegetables. Go, Jean, of course. Potatoes, okay. eggplants, and tomatoes. Yes, potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants. There you go. Oh, you got it, Stu. Did you get it? Did you get it? Stu's the, the other gardener in the household. There you go. Okay, beautiful. Potato, tomato, and eggplant. Now, here's my next question. Where's Shani? Shanaz, this one's for you. There are three words that we use for the, the, um, the vegetable eggplant in um, English-speaking countries. One is eggplant. What's the other? Aubergine. Aubergine. What's the third? Brinjal, yes, my friend, there at the back. Oh, okay, Shani, I'm gonna roll it. Are you ready? 
she's going to get it. Barry's going to make sure she gets it. Okay. All right, well, that was fun. Thank you, Yasha, for suggesting um, the plant Bitter Nightshade as part of this. The photo of the flower on the right has a little bit of bittersweet um, representation for us. I've learned it was taken actually in Ottawa. And Ottawa is where Maisie, our eldest, is living this year. And it was bittersweet because this was the first year she didn't come home for Christmas. But this is the way of us as parents, right? We have those bittersweet moments. Okay, not everyone associates bittersweet with plants or family. <clears throat> Gordy, apparently, Yasha, you're going to have to take another one for Gordy. You ready? Because Gordy, Gordy associates the word bittersweet with the moment in January that he opens his visa bill. <laughs> I love it. And uh, for me, you'll see orchids throughout all the pictures of today's service. And for me, orchids are bittersweet because they are so beautiful to behold, but I can't keep one alive to save my life. So last chocolate, who is a successful orchid farmer in this, this congregation? Anyone? Yes, nice. Okay, I'm going to roll a few down the floor. Ready? Here we go. Coming at you, Elgin. And we'll get them to you afterwards if you don't. All right, let's light our chalice. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. Thank you, Marcia. In addition to the chalice, we light two other candles today. The first is joys and sorrows in our community. You might have something you're celebrating or something that's weighing heavy on your heart. I have two that I'll bring a call to. There's one congregant who actually arrived here this morning and then departed on their way to Emerge. So there's one of our congregants sitting in Emerge right now, so I'm gonna ask that we hold them in, their, in our hearts. And the other that I wanna hold up this morning is Carrie and Liz, who have been absolutely an incredible love and surround and support to Nancy. And no sooner were they, were they through Nancy's death than now they're planning the memorial. And I just think they've been an incredible gift to Nancy and to our community in the last few months. So I want to hold them up in our joys and concerns this morning. And that second candle, of course, is for global concern. Well, where do you start? <laughs> Um, I think in particular this morning we'll continue to hold the ongoing devastation in Israel and Gaza. It's just so difficult to see how this can end. So we can hold them in light and offer kindness and empathy to all in our words and actions. May there be peace somehow. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, read you the story of the farmer. This is over um, 2,000 years old. It's credited to the scholar and ruler Louis An, who compiled and assembled uh, much of the Taoist wisdom tales from that period in Chinese history. And he lived in complicated times politically, as well as uh, a time of great uh, creativity culturally and in philosophy. A farmer's horse ran off, and try as he might, the farmer could not catch him. His neighbor, seeing this, rushed to the farmer's side and said, how bad for you. Now you've no horse to haul your wood. The farmer looked at the dust in the distance and said, I don't know if it's bad or if it's good. The next day, the horse came back with a mate, a beautiful wild mare it had found in the fields. When the neighbor saw two horses in the farmer's stall, he said, how good for you. You must be glad. Once again, the farmer said, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. The next day, the farmer's son decided to try to tame this wild mare. The horse threw the boy and stepped on his legs in many places. The farmer rushed into the field, and he was, as he was lifting his injured boy, the neighbor saw what had happened. The neighbor ran to the farmer and said, oh, how bad for you. Your sorrow was understood. The farmer looked up with the tears in his eyes and said once again, I don't know if it's bad or if it's good. In time, the country went to war. All the able-bodied youths were conscripted the farmer, 
with his arm around his limping boy who leaned on his crutch, and the neighbor stood alongside the road as row upon row of young men marched off to the battlefield. The neighbor wiped a tear from his eye as he waved goodbye to his only two sons, who walked away to join the columns with sturdy strides. He turned to the farmer and said, say it, how good for you. Your son is home, you must be glad. Again, the farmer sighed, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. And that's the way this tale ends. Please rise as we join in singing, Come Sing a Song with Me. Come sing a song with me. Uh, thank you, Marcia, for reading the parable of the farmer. I have two thoughts about that. The first is a bit cynical. They had really nosy neighbors, just going to say. Um, but I should discard that cynicism and be much more lofty. All right. Um, the premise of that is maybe yes, maybe no. So, being a participatory service, I'd like you all to say that. Maybe yes, maybe no. Try it. Maybe yes, maybe no. Try it again. Maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, now before we say it again, I want you to picture yourself having been asked something extremely irritating by your spouse, your neighbor, or your in-law. Ready? Picture it. Gritted teeth. Maybe yes, maybe no. Okay. And then the other thing to do is pause one or two seconds before you answer any question, because that's actually helpful to us formulating a much nicer response to any question we're asked. Ready? We're going to pause. Maybe yes, maybe no. Excellent. Well, why are we practicing? Because that kind of answer is actually not how most of us opinionated you, you people answer anything. And I personally need to say it a few more times because I know in the next few weeks my teenager Annabelle and my spouse Jill will definitely be answering any question that I ask with a cynical maybe yes, maybe no in the weeks ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the story of the farmer teaches us about suspending judgment. 
that we really cannot always tell what is fortunate and what is unlucky, and that we would be wiser to withhold our judgment rather than definitively say whether what happens is good or bad. And I think Marcia has a story of her own to share about that, how we can never really know what is good or bad. Sometimes it's both. Thanks, Rebecca. Joy and woe are woven fine, clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. A few words on Bittersweet by William Blake, British mystic, artist, and poet, who lived through cultural, political, and religious upheaval as the 18th century gave way to the 19th. My story begins in the winter of 1979-80, when I started attending an evening program with a small group of people at a little house at 21st and Gordon Avenue in West Man. We were writing journal entries on topics posed by the leaders, sharing the odd paragraph aloud and comparing notes. It was an oasis of quiet reflection in my busy week as a working mother of a three-year-old boy. I was pregnant with a second baby and still teaching half-time at a local high school. Looking forward to my maternity leave that was scheduled to begin at spring break. I had found my way into this writing circle after attending an info night at the Unitarian Church at 49th and Oak. Our leaders were Rod Stewart and Lynn Webster, and the writing circle was sponsored by North Shore Unitarians. I was intrigued by these churchgoers who didn't talk like parishioners from the Christian faith I had left behind. My spouse had recently shifted into a career change that saw him consulting for local companies as well as flying to remote locations in BC for overnight stays with clients on First Nations reserves. We were happily anticipating the birth of our second child, confident that we could draw upon all the parenting skills we had learned with the first. Both sets of grandparents lived a thousand miles away in California, poised to take turns visiting us to help out after the new baby arrived. Sure, we had stresses and woes, but the future looked bright. I was hopeful that my experiment with the writing circle might lead to further involvement, but happy when the intro program came to an end. One less thing on my to-do list. As crocuses gave way to daffodils and then to tulips, I was relieved to turn my school keys over to my mat leave substitute and focus my energies on getting the house and my firstborn ready for a new baby. We were still sharing the costs of an English nanny with the mother of another three-year-old. Our friend had a spare bedroom for the nanny to live in, but needed our help with salary and expenses. It was a win-win for all of us. One Tuesday afternoon in April, I took my son Eric to a park so he could run off some steam and realize that I could barely keep up. The next morning, I woke up early with an odd sense that some weird sensations I was experiencing might be something more than practice contractions. But how could that be? These mild symptoms didn't feel anything like the labor I remembered that was textbook from my first. The baby wasn't due for three more weeks, and our first refresher class at Lionsgate wasn't gonna happen until the Saturday. Jim was scheduled to take a float plane to the island that day for a follow-up consult with the couch and knitters. Somehow, I convinced him to cancel that, and we started packing up a few things before dropping Eric at the nanny's. After that, things moved very fast. We parked near the wrong old ER entrance on 13th, and I tried not to push as I made my way up the stairs. Soon, I was being rolled along in a wheelchair, filling out an intake form on the fly. Adam was born 45 minutes after our arrival. Our surge of euphoria at his birth was soon replaced by confusion and alarm when the nurses whisked him away. 
I barely caught a glimpse of his tiny face through the swaddling and the oxygen tube. For the next three days, I went through the motions of coping, nodding my head when the medical staff explained that Adam's immature lungs had sent him into infant respiratory distress. Jim stopped by when he could take a break from caring for Eric, and we tried to look calm and hopeful when the pediatrician assured us that 48 hours with high oxygen in the incubator would turn the situation around. Indicators were good that a trip by ambulance to specialized care over the bridge wasn't necessary. Jim's parents had hit the road and hoped to reach Vancouver by Saturday. When my roommate nursed her baby and celebrated with visiting family and friends, I left the, the room to go cry in the stairwell. Somehow the stats and the science from the staff weren't getting through to my psyche. Food tasted like sawdust, and sleep was elusive. I shuffled back and forth to the nursery, trying to convince myself that sometime soon, those clenched fists, heaving chest, and my baby's, eye, my baby's eyes wouldn't be squinted so tight shut with the effort it took to breathe. One afternoon, when I was staring at the book propped up on my stomach, a woman came in asking for Marcia. I had never seen her before, but she introduced herself as a volunteer from the North Shore Church, visiting me because I'd scribbled Unitarian as my religion in the blank on the hospital form. She listened quietly while I explained through a blubber of tears that my baby couldn't leave the incubator, and I felt useless. Her response was to ask me if I knew what centering myself was. When I managed a week, I guess so, she suggested I try centering myself, centering my energies over my son through the plastic and stroking the energy I felt down his spine, right over that casing of the incubator. I was puzzled, but expressed my thanks, and we exchanged a few more pleasantries before she said goodbye. And then I tried it. What have I got to lose? I thought. Over and over again. Each time I delivered my small vials of expressed milk to the nursery, stroking the energy down Adam's spine and feeling the connection between the two of us. That simple practice turned my emotions around. When I made my way to the nursery on the morning of the third day, there were Adam's wide open blue eyes to greet me, and our bonding process had already begun. I'm not to this day sure who that mystery woman was. Of course, Adam's recovery to full health is the sweetest part of this bittersweet story, but the kindness and compassion of that visitor, still unknown to me, confirmed my decision that those Unitarians were a community worth joining, both for me and my young family. Thanks. Thank you, Marcia. So what do we do with our pain? The musician and writer Nick Cave offers as far as I can see, we have two choices. We either eventually transform our suffering into something else, or we hold on to it and still eventually pass it on. In order to transform our pain, we must first acknowledge that all people suffer, that we're not alone in being in pain. And then we can see people more compassionately, and this allows us to forgive the world and ourselves. And therein, we slowly aim to reduce the world's net suffering and defiantly rehabilitate the world. This is good. This is beautiful. I would add, this is lofty. But if we don't transform our suffering, at some point, we will instead transmit our pain to others in the form of cynicism, blaming, victimhood, hatred, misanthropy, or outright abuse. 
and those are unfortunately commonly observed behaviors, then they simply pass on the pain to others and compound the world's suffering. Not good, not beautiful. We can best respond to pain by acknowledging it, by sitting with it, exploring it, and eventually turning it into something else, a story, an art, an innovation, healing, or anything else that nourishes us. Some of you have met my dad, Dave. He's visited here a few times in the last year, and he turned 80 last March. He's a man that I quite admire. I haven't known him well in my life, but I've come to know him well in the last few years. He married my stepmom in 1981. They own a nice little townhouse in Whitby, Ontario, suburbia. They have nice neighbors around who gather for a game of bridge or drinks or desserts every now and then. They have a two-year-old dog that my dad affectionately calls the puppy. She's a cute little shit. I mean, shih tzu, sorry. I always struggle over that word. Her name is Jade. That's the sweet of the story. The bitter is that my stepmom went into full-time care nearly two years ago at the age of 70. She's just had her 72nd birthday. She has a rapidly progressing dementia that has left her unable to walk and incapable of words. She speaks sounds and syllables, but they don't go together in any recognizable pattern. Her face exudes emotion. She can laugh, she sheds tears, but she can't be understood by others, including her beloved husband of 42 years. My dad and the dog visit every single day. My dad's had his own grief journey, questioning, lamenting, yearning the future they should have had, those golden years that they planned for financially, that they dreamed of romantically. They'd earned it. And that dream was taken from them, painstakingly. Day by day, week by week, in the year or two before she went into a home, my dad witnessed the gradual but marked deterioration. He remembers vividly the day several years before her formal diagnosis when she, in her mid-60s, stood there in the front hallway and recounted to my dad in full detail the story that she had just told him moments earlier. And he stood there, cold in his tracks, thinking, realizing the path they might just be embarking on. It's not an uncommon story. But she's young to have that story. My dad will openly share about his emotional journey. The sweet or bittersweet sweet part to this story is how a few months ago, just a few months ago, when my dad truly acknowledged the inevitability of the situation, and he realized that every time that he went to the home and left, which he does every day when he visits, every time he left, he was sad. And he realized that that grief was robbing him of joy. So he made a conscious decision. He decided that his job every day was simple. Every time he visited with the puppy, he would bring a little bit of joy to anyone he met there. So every day now when he goes, he takes a cookie or a chocolate. He looks up one or two silly jokes that he shares with the staff or any other residents that he sees on the way in or out. And he appreciates the little sparks of joy that he can bring wherever he goes. <clears throat> He knows not how long this will last. But that day, as he chose to shift his grief, he started to transform his heartache, his yearning for what was never going to be into something creative, something positive. He recognized, or maybe he even embodies that expression, that sometimes the cure for pain is in the pain. I hope I have that fortitude one day. There's another part to bittersweet that I want to explore. We've talked about how life events can be both bitter and sweet at the same time, or maybe separated by time or insight that bitter can turn into sweet. It feels important to me to recognize that moments in life can be sweet for one of us and bitter uh, simultaneously for another. So my dad married his wife in December 1981. He recalls it vividly. He remembers it as a joyous event, and I'm so glad he does. It was a ceremony and celebration to officially start, uh, to officially mark the start of many happy years together. In December 1981, I was 10 years old, and I remember that event like it was yesterday. They got married in City Hall, and then they had a wedding party that was in this kind of weird, unfamiliar hotel in downtown Toronto. So far, it felt like, so far from the little community that I grew up in. I was wearing this pretty new dress that itched in a weird way. <laughs> And I stood there and I watched people celebrate my dad getting married, not to my mom. 
I was trying to be so strong and grown up because I was one of the only children there, and all the while fighting back the tears in the realization that this really was it. They were never getting back together. That was this door that I had held open in my mind for like two and a half years, somehow held it open in my kid-like way. And in that moment, at that party, that door shut very painfully. So sweet for my dad and so bitter, sad for myself and my brother. But I survived it. I probably grew up a little more quickly. I definitely grew up a bit more street smart. I was fortunate to have a strong and strong-willed mum who taught me that life goes on. She exemplified resilience and coping and finding bargains when you don't quite have enough money for groceries and that it's okay to get a second job if you need the money and that volunteerism is possible no matter how busy you are. And because she was a single mom, she had no partner to tell her stories from work at the end of the day. I mean, we had some amazing dinnertime conversations. And through those stories, I saw how she lived and breathed that message of how a little bit of education and a whole lot of compassion can make a huge impact on people's lives. And she taught me never to give up. It's all bittersweet, isn't it? I mean, we all have these stories. It's about learning. It's about adjusting. It's about surrendering. It's about liberating the sweet, the love, the joy that can be found in those moments or events of our lives. Those who let their eyes adjust can learn to see in the darkness. We don't have to pretend that the hard parts of life don't hurt. The hard parts of life are hard. We get wounded, and the wounds turn into scars, and sometimes the scars have something to teach us, eventually. Our wounds and our scars, they're deep parts of our story, but they never have to be the conclusion to our story. We can slowly learn new stories from our pain, and one day, one day, those scars, they might actually be the brightest, best parts of our story. Those who speak about the light while banishing the darker, walking the right, cut in half. Living from the head while denying the flesh will only get you so far. We came to this earth to experience it all, the messy hand. Show me that you're human, I will kiss your scars, celebrating everything, all that you are. Oh, I'm a sinner and a saint, and this I have embraced, enjoying every aspect of life. <clears throat> Perfection is dull and unattainable. Leaving me craving what is real <clears throat> We came to this earth to experience it all The messy and the beautiful So show me that you're human I will kiss your scars Celebrating everything
Thank you, Allison. So beautiful. So the thoughts for this service titled Bittersweet started as I read an excellent book titled Bittersweet by Susan Cain, published in 2022. Susan's a well-known author. She also wrote the book Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, which is also an excellent read. If you live with an introvert, you should read this book. If you are an introvert, you must read this book. <laughs> and then you must tell your loved ones that they should read this book. Yeah. Interestingly, there's another book called Bittersweet by Shauna Nyquist, published in 2020. I've only read snippets of that book. It seems also very good, although it's written from a very Christian perspective. Still much we can learn from. Both books start with much of what we've been talking about, recognizing that light and dark, birth and death, bitter and sweet, are forever paired, that the tragedy of life is linked inescapably with its splendor. Susan Cain writes, you could tear civilization down, and rebuild it from scratch, and those same dualities would live again. Shauna Nyquist, the author of the other book, says, I love the bittersweet. There's something honest about it, something real. There's comfort in knowing that moments in life aren't all happy or sad. There's recognition that every time you celebrate, it's okay to feel a little bit blue about an aspect of your joy, and that every time you're down, it's healthy to look for something to be thankful for, the small mercies. There is Sufi wisdom in the Arabic phrase yom asai wa yom basai. I'm not sure I'm speaking Arabic very well, but it means one day honey, one day onions. It's probably more accurate, albeit a little less poetic, to say something like most days you'll have an onion in one hand and a small bowl of honey in the other. It's like Leonard Cohen says, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So part of today's bittersweet is exploring that belief that we can hold both joy and pain at the same time. Now a different take on bittersweet that is described interestingly in both books is recognizing that deep longing that we all have, that longing for a perfect and more beautiful world. It's a bittersweet, almost melancholic feeling that we get when we listen to a beautiful piece of music, when we stand in silence in front of a stunning piece of art when we watch an amazingly executed sports event, when we witness our child or our grandchild struggle with something and then master it for the first time, there's something deeply special in those moments. Like we taste the magic of perfection, something from another place, something that none of us will ever fully reach. We get moments of it, but they're fleeting. And so much of our lives are actually spent seeking that longing, what we think is some other world, a feeling that seems forever out of reach. And we realize, we must realize, that that's part of what's going on with the gross consumerism in today's world. And it's certainly what is behind the social media lens of true market inauthentic life portrayed as true and real. We all have that longing. Whether you're deeply religious or you're pagan or you're humanist or you're a scientist, you know what I'm speaking of. People have called it a feeling of poignancy, an acute awareness of the passing of time, a curiously piercing joy at the beauty of the world. Some describe it as uh, a desire for communion. I think Jewish people and Christian people might call it heaven. The Sufis would call it the beloved of the soul. C.S. Lewis called it the place where all the beauty came from. It's that bittersweet feeling that kind of reaches to the deepest desires of the human heart. Susan Cain shares how she started her book to solve the mystery of why so many people respond so intensely to sad music. In her exploration, she comes to understand that that music is just a gateway to that deeper realm where you notice that the world is sacred, mysterious, enchanted even. Many people enter this realm through music in the minor key. Others enter it through art, sport, writing, some people enter it through formal prayers, meditation. Those entryways, they're everywhere, and they take on endless forms. And they are those moments when our disbelief loosens its hold and we're permitted to experience that lovely lightness of spirit, an elevated oneness with things, communion. Whether you're an atheist or you call it what you like, or you're a believer, you can call it what you like. It's a manifestation of love or divinity or healing or beauty, whatever term works for you. Susan Cain concludes her book with urging us to take note of where we find those portals to the sacred 
and determine who, where those entryways are individually and collectively and step into them whenever we can. Because doing so can transform the way we live, the way we create, the way we parent, the way we lead, the way we love, and the way we die. It helps us to understand each other and ourselves. William Blake said, we, come, we become what we behold. Please rise, embody your spirit, and sing, We Laugh, We Cry, hymn 354. We laugh, we cry, we live, we die, we dance, we sing a song. We need to feel there's something here to which we can belong. We need to feel the freedom just to us. today is going to look out housing and health society it's a charitable organization and social safety net it was founded in 1971 to meet the needs of a growing number of homeless adults in the downtown east side its services include shelters supportive housing independent housing outreach health services and resource centers lookout operates 69 facilities 50 housing programs and 16 emergency shelters across vancouver fraser valley and vancouver island Please give as generously as you're able. And as the offering basket is passed, please help yourself to a piece of bittersweet chocolate. <laughs>
two announcements. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just echo what Rebecca mentioned at the start of the service, that we're going to experiment with having um, coffee and tea and goodies upstairs in the foyer. You can grab there. Uh, grab your goodies out there, and also if you're new today, we'd like to welcome you to this table um, at the side with the white tablecloth. Also, um, coming up, so that's to visit informally with board members and anyone else who'd like to greet you. But I'd also like to extend my own invitation for anyone um, who's here today or next week to join Jean Prescott and me Next Sunday, after church in the sanctuary, after you've picked up your coffee, we'll be bringing our own goodies. We're going to screen a video from the Joanna Wagstaff series, Planet Wonder, on the environmental cost of fast fashion and what we can do about it. So we'll hold a short discussion after that video. And um, I will be wearing one of the oldest garments in my closet to this event. I might even talk my husband into wearing one of his prized garments that we keep folded up in the drawer. And that will be the kickoff to some uh, conversations about clothing and how uh, our decisions about clothing make a difference in the world, leading up to a clothing exchange that will happen on the premises here in April. But we'll start with a, with a really thought-provoking video from Joanna Wagstaff next Sunday after church, right here. Thank you. Two other announcements, actually, yeah, two or three. Um, next week's service, Dennis Cooper is gonna lead a service on creativity. Creativity allows you to experience your spirit through six senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste, and the extraordinary intuition and perception of knowing without knowing why. Creativity invites us every day to see the world anew and in the moments while creating, time expands in inexplainable ways. I can't let that pass without mentioning that taste has bitter and sweet. Just, just had to mention that connection. Sorry. Um, January 21st is a social justice workshop here. Uh, we're going to discuss how we can lift up mental health as a focus for the rest of this year. Join Allison after the service here and learn more about that. And lastly, our community has our annual budget meeting on Sunday, January 28th, after the service. This is a very important meeting. There's some critical conversations about our future and how we want to continue to live and grow together. So please plan to join the meeting that day. There will be lunch provided, and you'll receive some further details in an email prior to then. That last announcement is a good little transition into a little epilogue of musings on bittersweet <clears throat> we'll close it off with some, some things right here about Unitarian Universalism and how it, they all relate. For this last part, I'm going to borrow some words from two UU ministers who have better words than I do. The first is Unitarian minister Mark Morrison-Reed. He says, religious community is essential. For alone, our vision is too narrow to see what all must be done, and our strength too limited to do all what must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. So that's why we joined a religious community. But why are we here at this UU congregation? Why are we not at the church down the road or the temple on Taylor Way? Well, we know why we're here, and Stephen Epperson probably says it best. This is a quote from him in 2012, believe it or not. Unitarians gather to enjoy and share the beauty of a distinctive kind of community, one that's built around an incredible living religion with its own long history of appreciation for diversity, doubt, and rational thought, one that grapples undogmatically with the mystery and wonder of life, one that creates a congenial community of diverse beliefs and shared values. Okay, let's unpick that a little. Why are we here? Well, those of us who are committed to being here in this community, we choose to be here for a number of reasons, but here's a few of them. Number one, power with the people. We choose as a congregation who our leaders are. We choose whether we have a minister and who that minister is. Those decisions don't come to us from some other hierarchy or an imposed structure. It's all about right here. Second, our religious policy affirms and promotes the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's a principal criterion in this religious community, and it has nothing to do with any authority, sanctity, attributes or existence of God, prophets, priests, or any specific texts. 
and the worth and dignity of every person. Well, it may be an imprecise kind of term or guide, but the every in that sentence, it reminds us that we're not just here about us. We're here because we need to stand up for social justice, that we must use what privileges and powers we have to work for the inherent worth and dignity of every soul. And third, that we are free to examine our faith. We're a progressive, religious, and moral place, and we believe it's worth discussing, testing, and exploring what we believe in. And lastly, we embrace radical diversity. Sitting in our pews at any one time could be people who are pagan, humanist, mystic, agnostic, atheist, or tender-hearted spiritual souls. You can love who you love. You can be who you are. That's why we're here. But bittersweet is the reality of Unitarian Universalism today. 2022, 2023, 2024. I mean, this congregation has just turned the corner on a couple of very tough years. A bitter, protracted departure of a minister and a division in this congregation that ripped us apart in ways we could have never anticipated a few years ago. And with vehemence and vitriol that we could have never imagined. Words said in spite and anger, mistruths spread, emails, letters, like including an open letter from a former board member that ends with, enjoy the ashes. What? But this congregation has come through that. We have proven ourselves not to be a congregational hospice. We're regathering our strength. We're led by a dedicated, cohesive board of kind, gentle, communicative people. We have some amazing committed staff who have stood by us and who continue to go above and beyond for this congregation. We've had some amazing services and we have circled around to take care of our people. We have rekindled our commitment to this community and rejuvenated our sense of who we are. It's been a very bittersweet year or two. We have some hard thinking ahead of us about what is next. January 28th, be there. And beyond these four walls, the potential future of Unitarian Universalism like in the world, well, that is also quite bittersweet. I'm not gonna delve into the mess, the drama, the politics at the UUA, but it is all working in parallel to the story that unfolded here at NSUC, and in fact, in many other UU congregations as we are still learning. We're deep in a time in society where it's the norm to just be so righteous about what is right and what is wrong, there is this frenetic energy invested in dogmatic self-righteousness and, I mean, complete suppression of any contrary thought. Like, that's cancel culture. And in the world today, there is this misguided sense of extreme political correctness and a frightening refusal to engage in the uncomfortable, any uncomfortable ideas, and that has an asphyxiating effect on community. Regardless of what the topic is, no matter how virtuous the intention, we must not have any lack of humility and we must not put forth any dogmatic certainty about any claim on any side on any issue. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm not so sure. Borrowing words from Tim Minchin, if the intention of the progressives is to progress forward into a future of more empathy and understanding for more people, then it cannot be that the primary mechanism by which we're gonna make that progress is the suppression of empathy and understanding for anyone who doesn't align with our beliefs. If we disagree, if we disagree with what someone says, our UU values say we should ask about that. We should be curious about that. We should try and understand where that thought or belief comes from. But sadly, that's not what happened in our congregation in the last few years. And that doesn't seem to be what's happening in the greater UU world right now. No one should eradicate the best of people just because they dislike the worst of them. We stand for the inherent worth and dignity of every soul. So we, individually and collectively, we need to transcend all of this, this current culture. We need to recognize and hold both joy and pain, find the shards of light anywhere, everywhere, and in everyone rebuild, be curious, be welcoming. In our individual lives and in the lives of this congregation, our stories are powerful, our wounds and our scars are deep, but they are not the end of our story. We must live the bittersweet, 
recognize that what seems bad might actually be good, that what seems wrong might have at least just a little bit of right, and that there is joy amongst endings, and we can say maybe yes, maybe no, to things that initially make us bristle. We can decide what we do with our pain. We can all examine the lessons of our own life sorrows and longings, longings, and we can find the portals into that lightness of spirit, stay there in that place we yearn for as long as we can, because it's never very long, and bring back that holy sense of connection, bring seeds of love, and spread them into this broken, beautiful, bittersweet world, however we can. Amen. Shalom and blessed be. Let's extinguish this flame. We extinguish this flame, but we carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of hope. This world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. Let's circle around.